the finish just simply couldn't script and the Pies injury toll reaches crisis levels as they hold on to their spot in the eight. All that and more to come on the round so far. But Kane Corns, we have to start with this match winner in the West. It's the best since Malcolm Blight. Jack Nunes getting the Blues over the line. They're now sitting a game outside the top eight. Yeah, it's a big call, the best since Malcolm Blight, but you're spot on. That did not look like missing. How about that for a drop punt? If he's had that 10 times, I'm not sure you could hit that any sweeter. So credit to him. I thought the way that he set up and moved the photographer and the chair out the way and make sure he was set and ready to go amidst all the chaos was just an epic finish. Now, that was the only goal scored in the whole of the last quarter, but that didn't paint the script of how intense, how competitive and how into it the players were tonight. So credit to them and it deserved that finish the game tonight. The Blues had to cop the Robbie Gray one a couple of weeks ago, but they got some back tonight. Let's break down how exactly it happened. This is Harry Mackay, 90 seconds on the clock, a chance to put the Blues in front. Goes across the face of goal into the lap of Liam Jones, of all people. Yeah, and he, he marked it. And then Eddie Betts, you can see him just sniffing around. He got the handball. The umpire called it back because it was illegal and he ran over the mark. Liam Jones kicked it skinny side, finishing not his specialty. And you thought probably Fremantle could hang on. Now, Matt Taverner here goes to the boundary line. What he needed to do is a big body, take possession of the ball and then get tackled over the boundary line. That was deliberate. And the ball came back in from Doherty and there's a free kick down the field, which I don't think is there. We'll take another look at it, Mitch. It's uh, Angus Brayshaw, who, of course, has Andrew Brayshaw, I should say, who gives the free kick away. I don't think it's there. Ball goes out of bounds on the fall and, and Nunes takes the free kick. So after the game, Justin Longmuir said if he had his time again, he would teach Andy Brayshaw to do the exact same thing. So in other words, in he, he felt it was the wrong call. Now, there's a bit of confusion whether the, the downfield should have been at the spot where Brayshaw bumps Doherty or downfield. They made the right call in taking it downfield. But as you're saying, I think you, you can argue that it shouldn't have been paid in the first place. Now, let's go again to the goal. Simply incredible what Jack Nunes is able to do. He probably should have had the ball in the first place, Kane. Longmuir again said Gib Gibbons probably should have had the ball and he pulled the wool over the umpire's eyes to end up with it, but he's hit it pretty sweet. Yeah, it was the wrong call. It was, a, it was a mistake and it's not good enough to make a mistake like that in such a pivotal moment. Can you imagine if that was a grand final? It was Michael Gibbons' ball. He was closest to it and he should have got the free kick. Now, this is Nunes earlier on in the game. Early on in the third, he misses one from what, 14 metres out directly in front. How ironic that he goes back and kicks one probably four times as hard as that one. But that's footy, and that's why it's such a great game. And the Blues kicked two goals, five in the third quarter. So they almost fluffed it and almost gave it back to the Dockers. They'll be shattered with that Fremantle. It pretty much ends their season. Hard to split the Saturday star tonight. Ed Kerno had 30-plus. Luke Ryan had 14 intercepts possessions. But how about this? Cade Simpson, our Saturday star, getting up and playing on after the Falcon of the Year. Yeah, you don't need that in game number 326. I can tell you that much on a wet and cold night in Perth. But you're right, Ryan was outstanding as well. And Cade Simpson for getting up and doing what he has done for so long. And look at his, his face. Clearly, it was a massive hit. Oh. And he's um, all red and sore there. So, well done to Cade Simpson. He's been one of my favourites for a long time now and still playing great footy. Well, Carlton now only sit a game outside the eight, and they could well take Collingwood's spot in a couple of weeks. The Pies bombed at the Gabba today. Melbourne winning by 56 points. They're into the eight for the first time since the end of 2018 now, the Demons, and he wanted to pick apart two incidents from clearances from the Pies. Yeah, yeah I do. I don't think Brodie Grundy's form in the last five weeks has been good enough. Now, granted, the Pies are coming off, what, a three-and-a-bit day break, so they're a bit weary. But have a look at this from... Braden Proust, Max Gorn's not even there. The defensive accountability from Grundy is nothing. He just waltzes out. His opponent sends it inside 50. And then Melbourne did this all night. They ran to the fall of the ball harder than the Collingwood defenders. And I just thought their defence, which has been so strong all year, Collingwood, to give up 100 points tonight on the back of efforts like this. Centre bounce goal. This is 30 seconds after the one we just saw. And have a look at this. Pies cough up the ball. Another easy goal walk in for Melbourne will take another look at it. How Proust can hit that to Clayton Oliver five metres outside of the centre circle. That means there's no effort from Grundy. Once again, Noble and Dunn cough the footy up and there's another walk-in goal to the Demons. We could have shown 10 clips of that tonight. Uh, Collingwood just didn't want to be there and their defence was as poor as I've seen it for a long, long time. 
and the Demons cracked the ton the first time they've done so since round 16 last year. So they've got that synergy finally working. Brayshaw was back in the middle and played well. Oliver and Petrarca among the best. But it's worrying now for the Pies, Kane. Already missing the goey. Uh, Jeremy Howe was out. They're starting to mount up. And this is a sickening blow from Brody Majek. Yeah, what an effort. I mean, we've got to laud players that do this. So, uh, you, know, you can argue whether he needed to do that and whether he was going to impact the contest or not. But that's how you win respect in the competition. It's a massive hit. Now, Glad eventually he started moving and um, he looked to be recovering okay, but you'd expect him to miss at least a couple of games with that and a severe incident. And this is Ben Reid. It's been the story of his last four or five years, sadly. Another hamstring, just his second game for the season. We didn't mention Adam Trelaw off the top earlier. Gee, it's going to be hard for the Pies to, to mount a case from here with these injuries. Yeah, it will be. I mean, when you, when you take out probably six out of, the, out of their best eight players, which they've been playing with, I know they got Pendlebury back, but you just can't. It just drops off. And when you're forced to back up after three and a half days, that's what's going to happen. So Collingwood, I just feel like they haven't had a full run of it injury-wise for a good four or five years, and it seems to be the case again this year. All right, to Metricon Stadium. Brisbane playing as your wayside against North Melbourne. The Lions have cashed in a third get-out-of-jail-free card. Chris Fagan wasn't happy at halftime. They led it by three points. But, gee, they look flat today, the Lions. I loved this from Chris Fagan because, yeah, I've seen him nice guy and, you know, really calm and collected and almost like a, a father figure to the players. But every now and then, you need a good old-fashioned bake. And this was Zerha. He was the most lively for the Kangaroos. Nearly basically won it off his own boot. Now, look at the time here, Mitch. He takes a massive contested mark inside 50. That's to put him within striking distance late in the game, and that one just drifts. And then, of course, he gets this gift after the siren, which means it was only a one-point deficit, which made the result look closer than it actually was. I never felt, felt like Brisbane were yeah. in danger of dropping this, but sometimes, you know, you just got to win. And that's what they did. They've played some great footy. No team, I don't think, no team has gone without lulls in the season. Brisbane have had a couple and they've been good enough to hang on and they're still in a really good position. Their third win this year by 12 points or less. They're equal now on points with Port Adelaide, just behind on percentage. Just for the Ruse, Luke Davies Uniac, his best game for some time. So positive for the Ruse that their their number four pick is starting to show some signs. Now, we saw Charlie Cameron, we mentioned it on last week's show, cop a big knock and landed awkwardly on that left knee. It was heavily strapped. This is his only highlight for the game. He had one scoring shot on the match. Gave Ed Vickers Willis one to go on with there. Didn't go back and kick the goal. Pretty sad and sorry day for Charlie. Yeah, I thought he turned his toes up, to be perfectly honest. Now, if you're fit, you're out there and you put your hand up, you've got to give effort. Now, that one there, he doesn't even compete. He's looking for the easy one out the back and he's got his, you know, his body language like this was poor. He's frustrated. And this is an interesting one as well. He kicks it on the left foot, which is clearly where the knee injury is, and we'll get another look at it, grabs straight for the knee. So they shouldn't have played him. They shouldn't have sent him back on the ground last week. But if he put his hand up, he had to give a better effort than he did today. So either play or not, and give yourself a couple of weeks off and get right because the Lions can't afford you to turn your toes up like you did today. Chris Fagan said medically it was the right call, but it it clearly can't be 100% if he's going to to fetch for his knee after that one. Do you think he should sit out for a game now, just just given it looks sore and uh, there's bigger things to fry at the end of the season? Well, the beauty of the teams like Port Adelaide and Geelong and Brisbane is they've banked those wins. They can afford to do that and look after your players. Like It's it's the finals that matter. Now, the top four is not going to be as important this year. You just need to finish top four. It doesn't matter where because of the home final situation. So you want that double chance. Brisbane will get that and they can afford to give you know a couple of their players a rest and, and rotate a few through and look after them, make sure they're right to go for the finals. You mentioned the Cats, probably the form side of the competition in the last... 10 to 14 days. Tom Hawkins, the best individual performance of the year. Six goals. We want to point out some down-the-ground vision. This is his starting point. The distance he was able to get and the one-on-ones they created was huge. Yeah, I thought it was poor coaching from Port Adelaide. I really did. Uh, Ken Hinckley's hardly put a foot wrong this year. I think he's been the coach of the year to the point in this. Now, it might change after this with Chris Scott, but the one-on-one space that Tom Hawkins got it isn't what the other teams do in the competition. You saw how many times Charlie Dixon was one against two and one against three. Well, Hawkins would be loving this. Good luck to any player in the competition to yeah. stop Tom Hawkins one-on-one when the ball comes in like this, let alone Tom Cleary, who's giving away six centimetres and probably 15 kilos. So time and time again, we're looking behind the goals. Look at the separation and how good Geelong's forwards were to identify Hawkins was the hot player. Cleary's in front of him, no match, perfect kick, just waited nicely for him. So 
I always think Ken Hinckley was keeping his powder dry and thinking, well, we don't want to give away too much. If we meet them in the finals, they're clearly going to put Jonas on him. They're going to drop one Ruckman. Westhoff's going to come back in and play that wing role and back and get back to support in front of Hawkins. But the decision to trade Dougal Howard as well is going to be interesting because the big forwards always get a hold of Port Adelaide. Hipwood did it earlier on in this year in McStay. Ben Brown kicked 10 on them last year. And they're going to have to face probably Kennedy, Rewalt, Lynch and Tom Hawkins again in the final. So I wonder whether they'd uh, benefit from having the big 200 centimetre St Kilda player Dougal Howard in their side still. Paddy Dangerfield kicking the ball as well as he has in some time forward. And Hawkins is 32. He's going to be a back-to-back All-Australian now, Kane. Out of contract, do you go one or two years? Because I think everything has to point to two years in the form that he's in. Yeah, everything's two years for me. I, I wouldn't be signing a one-year deal if I was Tom Hawkins. If Geelong don't want to give it to you, someone else will. So there's no one coming through threatening his spot. You know, Jenkins hasn't played yet. So... He's absolutely deserving of a two-year contract. Now, whether that's got some performance clauses in it, I'm not sure, but clearly he loves Geelong. He's happy there. He'll want to finish his career there, and he deserves a two-year contract. I've never seen him this fit and as hungry, and he just looks to be enjoying his footy. And he's he's unselfish too. Like, he kicks six, but he handed off three or four as well, and that was the best individual performance I've seen this year. All right, back to Thursday night. City would have loved every bit of this through the Giants. Finals hopes into chaos. The Giants lowest score, equal lowest score with the grand final last year. Some of these efforts, these broken tackles in the first quarter were alarming. This is as damning a vision as you're going to see from any side who thinks they're a contender this year. Three broken tackles. That's a second year player in row bottom just brushing off Lockie Whitfield. And it's not just isolated. I mean, have a look at the lack of defensive accountability there. I mean, what are the Giants thinking is going to happen there? There was three of them lining up and ready to go. It's the best kick on the ground, Jordan Dawson. Yeah, and it could have gone to Papley also. So they just did not want to be there. And uh, once again, we'll show more of this. And this isn't fatigue. This is first quarter stuff. Look at this, Nick Haynes, season player. It's Robottom again, a second year player, making them look absolutely silly and marking it uncontested inside 50. The easiest position to defend is from a kick in. We'll have a look at this. Walk through, Melican just, and then the ball's cleared. Pressure is off. So... I just thought it was a really poor effort and one of the worst displays I've seen. Now, this is the captain just after he'd given the spray at halftime to the host broadcaster saying it wasn't good enough. That's his first effort after he made those claims. So it's not young players. It's the experienced players letting the Giants down and they deserve to be where they are right now and they deserve that performance. Yeah, Steve Canelio called the first half hopeless. That was 15 seconds into the second half. Now, we've spoken about Leon Cameron's contract. They've stamped it. They said he's going to get a two-year extension. Talk us through some of this uh, this method here because he said the first quarter was effort. This looks like system-based. They had 52 inside 50s, Kane, and can only manage three goals. Yeah, it's just not the Giants that we know and we came to love with the style of play they were playing. Like That's just hat kick. Now, the Giants that were playing that deadly footy at times last year and in 2017 are win the inside ball and shovel it out to the outside and get teams on the breakaway. They were the most powerful running side in the competition. That's a horrific turnover on the last line of defence. There's a goal against. So there's the handball. Then it should be the spread to the outside to Kelly and Whitfield and the runners that they've always had and Cornelio. Now, this is not going to be conducive to kicking a winning score. That's why they kicked three goals for the night. They were all from free kicks. It's why they've struggled to get inside 50s all year. And it's why they're struggling to score. And it doesn't matter who you've got up there, Jeremy Cameron, Himmelberg, Finlayson, whoever it is, you're not going to um, get on the end of, of rubbish like that. All right, back to Wednesday. Essendon, probably unlucky to escape with a draw against Gold Coast, but it'll be a crucial two points in their run home. They play St Kilda tomorrow. Let's have a look at Essendon's run home. You think the next two weeks is make or break? Yeah, I, I, I do think that because they're really good sides in St. Kilda and Richmond. Now, they won't start favourite in any of those. Still got West Coast, Geelong and Port Adelaide. So basically three out of the top four sides and Melbourne have returned to some good form as well. So they're not making the finals, Essendon. It's going to be another wasted year for them. I don't understand the coaching transition situation. I don't understand the makeup of their list. Yes, I know they've got injuries, but a lot of sides have had injuries this year and challenges. They're just not playing good enough footy to to challenge this year. And unfortunately, it's another wasted year for the Bombers. Well, that clash with St Kilda is one of big games tomorrow. Let's have a look at the rest of the round as it sits. Crows still looking for their first win, but the Dogs need one equally as bad. Yeah, dropped uh, Darcy Fogarty as well. So I didn't think Taylor Walker and Fogarty could function in the same forward line. So Rory Sloan back in for that one. We mentioned the Saints and the Essendon game. 
Good luck to Hawthorne. If Clarko's going a bit younger at selection, three changes for the Hawks. They're not going to beat West Coast. And then a good game on Monday night, although the Gold Coast Suns have only won one out of their last seven, Mitch, and Richmond will be looking to respond hard. All right, we're going to go back to Friday night for our one more thing. We thought this could only happen in Melbourne between Marvel Stadium and the MCG. This is Luke Hodge going to the wrong ground on Friday night. <laughs> well, he's been doing so much footy. Hodgie, uh, hasn't he? He just went to, to the, the wrong ground. ground. ground Luke. And Dangerfield just reminding him of it. Right so, a um, bit embarrassing, but he got there in the end. Well, it's still a pretty sharp jacket from Lou Hodge. It's not a bad problem to have to have two grounds to, to choose from up in uh, up in Queensland. Yeah, well, it's the best spot to be in Australia probably right now. Footy's on, weather's good, and not many restrictions. Nice to see you've chosen a different spot in your, your lounge room as well, Kane. <laughs> Just thought I'd change it up tonight, Mitch. All right, we might see you on the tennis court next week right here on the round so far. I'll see you then.